we've got several different stories to cover from many different outlets you guys it's time for another episode of the world's news round let's go Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. This is Really Gonna Eat here with another episode of the World's News Round where I cover various stories from outside the UK. The date and time of this recording is the 30th of April 2024 at 9 a.m. And we start here with an article from Association Press with the headline of Israel, Hamas, war protesters and police are clashing on Texas campus, Columbia, as the university begins suspensions. This is uh, something that's been brewing for quite a while. Um, I have covered one or two shorts on this story, but I think it's only fair that we actually go into a bit more deeper dive into this. So what's what's basically what's the story about before we read into it? So basically, essentially, they're trying to raise uh, the protesting is about obviously about the Israel Hamas war and they're trying to uh, basically make their voices heard to say that we Basically, they want a ceasefire. They want the, the what's happening over there to stop. And unfortunately, that there there is a way of, of doing things. And I don't know whether or not these these protests that they're taking place on these campuses are actually helping or mitigating what, what's going to go, what's happening in the Middle East. And I don't think, like, I understand myself and I'm sure many people in the chat want a ceasefire to occur. And still at the time of this recording, we haven't heard about a ceasefire, sadly. Um... And it's it's incredibly frustrating that people who have relatives or connections, associations whatsoever with 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 those over there in the Middle East who live and work and and study and whatnot here in in, in America or anywhere else for that matter, feeling powerless as 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 society becomes <coughs> as so many people die needlessly, and unfortunately, uh, and I've spoken about this before about how many uh, many Jewish people up around the world are being victimized at no fault of their own because of what the Israeli government are doing and the atrocities that they have caused within the Gaza Strip. Now, we've said this before and we've said this again about how much we condemn what Hamas has done and Hamas should pay for its out outrageous, disgusting crime that it caused on October the 7th. However, what Israel, the Israeli government and what it's done and the way it's handled itself and conducting itself ever since, the, ever since, the, ever since then has been nothing short of disgusting and outrageous and inhumane and it's and the defense from uh from western nations such as america uk and others have been pretty despicable and understandably um if understandably if what people ha have been taught what is right and wrong and and justice and whatnot in the way that america are treating israel in comparison to the, the rest of the world kind of spits in the face of british uh general democratic values it goes against the democratic values that's that many people have been raised and taught to believe um because they are simply not applying anywhere near enough pressure on israel to, to stop or to call for a ceasefire um to protect the civilian life within there and it's now that and it's and it's having an effect in america there are many many people within in america who are not going to vote for President Joe Biden? Not because they they want to vote for President for for former President Trump. No, they're gonna vote. They're not going to vote for President Biden simply because of what his position on on this. Um, and it's it's which is a, a problem problematic as well. So, yeah, this is not good. Um, like I said, this has been going on for a while. So let's read a bit more into it. So protesters and police clashed on last Monday at the University of Texas in a confrontation that resulted in dozens of arrests and Columbia University began suspending students as colleges around the U.S. begged pro-Palestinian demonstrators to clear out tent encampments as commencing ceremonies approach. From coast to coast, demonstrators and sparred over the Israel Hamas war and its mounting death toll and the number of arrests at campuses nationwide is approaching a thousand as the final days of class wrap up. The outcry is forcing colleges to reckon with their financial ties to Israel as well as their support to free speech. Some Jewish students says the protests have veered into anti-Semitism and make them afraid to set foot on campuses. Because of such connections, because of the history between America and Israel, <coughs> this is protesters' way of causing disruption uh, for what's happening over there. And while I understand... And I want to be, choose my words very here very carefully... Targeting these 
uh, campuses. I understand the, the financial ties and connections to Israel. I get that. But punishing or victimizing uh, those who are studying and whatnot and in these campuses who, who are some of the Jewish students and whatnot, targeting them and, and whatnot is, is just wrong. It's despicable. It's wrong. And you're not helping anyone in this situation. Um, I get, I understand the the determination to try and make disrupt and make things as difficult as possible between Israel and America, and this is one of their ways of doing it: boycotting certain shops and and whatnot, and all these kind of things. I get all that, but the the attacks to 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 go towards the like like I've said, leave Jewish people alone, leave them out of this. Don't punish them. Don't call anti-Semitism on them, even if they are for Israel and what's going on over there. That's not you're not helping anyone whatsoever. Um, a part of me is like, I understand why they're doing what they're doing, but a part of me is like, are you sure you're not going too far either? But then again, <clears throat> people will suggest to me and say, yeah, but people are literally dying within the Gaza Strip region. We just spoke about that, so I am I am a bit conflicted on this as well. So the protests have even spread to Europe, with French police removing dozens of students from a Singapore university after pro-Palestinian protesters occupied the main courtyard. In Canada, student groups camps have popped up at the University of Ottawa, and McGill University in Montreal, and the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, the Canadian press have reported. At the University of Texas at Austin, an attorney said at least 40 demonstrators had, arrested, had been arrested on Monday on charges of trespassing and disorderly conduct. Some of them uh, by officers in riot gear who encircled about 100 sitting protesters, dragging and carried them out one by one amidst screams. Another group of demonstrators trapped police and a van full of arrestees between buildings, creating a mass of body pushing and shoving, prompting the officers to use pepper spray and flashbang devices to clear the crowds. The confrontation it was an escalation of uh, on the 53,000 student campus in the state capital, where more than 50 protesters were arrested last week. The university late Monday issued a statement saying that many of Monday's protesters were not affiliated with the school and that the encampments are prohibited on campus. The school also alleged that some demonstrators were physically and verbally combative, with university staff prompting officials to call law enforcement. Yeah, that's um, <coughs> that. If that's true, that's going too far. Um, yeah, this you're going too far here. I get, I understand, I understand you're trying. I'm trying to make a protest. I understand that. But there, there are lines, and I do think that's that's going too far, in my opinion. The plight of students who have been arrested has become a central part of protests, with the students and growing numbers of faculties demanding amnesty for protesters. <coughs> An issue as to whether the suspensions and legal records will follow students through their adult lives. I don't think they should be given these records throughout their, the rest of their lives. I don't think so. I think they should be granted amnesty, if I'm honest. Um... A young a pro Palestinian protester yells "Free Palestine!" as she's handcuffed. Protesters taken away by the University of Austin, Austin police. Yeah, it's um, not um, not good image for America whatsoever because it, it goes against the whole free amendment and whatnot. But there are lines as well, and the question I think, I suppose the big question is: Are we are they crossing a line here? The Texas protests protest and others grew out of Columbia early demonstrations that have continued. On Monday, student activists on the school Manhattan campus defied a 2 p.m. deadline to leave the encampment of around 120 tents. If they left, left by the deadline and signed a form committing to abide by the university policies through June 2025, officials said they could finish the semester in good standards. If not, they would be suspended pending further investigation. Instead, hundreds of protesters remained marching around the quad and weaving around piles of temporary flooring and green carpeting meant for graduation ceremonies that are supposed to begin next week. A handful of counter-demonstrators waving Israeli flags with one held a sign reading, Where are the anti-Hamas chants? And while the university didn't call police to rouse the demonstrators, school spokesperson Ben Chang said the suspensions had started. He said that while the university appreciated that the free speech rights of students, the encampment was a noisy distraction and that was interfering with teaching and preparation for final exams. The university, the university said it will offer an alternative venue for the protesters for the protests after exams and graduations. The protests also made some Jewish students deeply uncomfortable, he said. Well, I, understandably... Uh, it's it's uh, I I get I get this I get I get what they're doing. I understand I really do, guys. But uh, I, how 
like and the thing is is that if you if i if i'm one of those protesters like i'm literally trying to put myself in two sides of this coin guys like on one side i'm putting myself in the shoes of one of these protesters who generally <clears throat> who feel so compassionate and so horrific about what's happening over in there and saying and i can see that person screaming at me saying what do you want me to do? What am I supposed to do? The government is not listening to me. They're not listening to our positions. They're not listening to our, our, our concerns. They're not doing anything about what's happening in, in what Israel are doing. What am I supposed to do? This is this is the this is the position that that these protesters are in. This is why they're doing what they're doing because they literally need to do something to make their voices heard. And that is the whole point of protesters. And this is why I'm trying to put my, I'm putting myself in the shoes of protesters to understand why they're doing what they're doing. And this is exactly how they feel. But on the other hand, I'm putting myself in the shoes of teachers and the students at these campuses who simply, like, I'm sure many of them are sympathetic to the cause that these protesters are doing. And um, and are not, uh, are, well, I know that we just read there that there are some defenders of Israel. But some are don't wish death upon anybody or whatsoever but to them it's like like i understand their point of view but uh, and we want it too but this is not the way of going about it disrupting these students disrupting these exams this is not going to not going to change anything with what's happening over in the middle east this is going to be the counter argument that i i have in my head about this because you're not going to you're like as much as they disrupt and cause disruption in these campuses and universities, not just here in other places, it's not going to make a difference. That's the infuriating thing. Yes, they're going to make a lot of noise. Yes, it's going to be in the papers. Yes, people are going to talk about it. But is it going to make a difference? Is it going to stop Israel doing what it's doing? And I'm sorry to say the answer is no. So and then for then well we're going you ask yourself well what are you supposed what are they supposed to do and the my honest absolute god truthful answer is I don't know I honestly don't know guys so that's kind of where I'm sitting right now with this a few other details from the university were immediately available such as how students were involved and how the suspensions would be carried out or whether suspended students would be ejected from the campus protest organisers said they were not aware of any suspensions as of Monday evening. Columbia's handling of the protest also prompted federal complaints. A class act lawsuit on behalf of Jewish students alleged a breach of contract by Columbia, claiming that the university failed to maintain a safe learning environment. Despite policies and promises, it also challenged the move away from main in-person classes and six quick court action requiring Columbia to provide security for the students. Meanwhile, a legal group representing pro-Palestinian students is urging the U.S. Department of Education and Civil Rights Office to investigate Columbia's compliance with the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and how they have been treated. A university spokesperson declined to comment on the complaints. In a rare case, a Northwestern University said it reached an agreement with students and a faculty who represent the majority of, of protesters on its campus near Chicago. It allows people demonstrators through the 1st of June end to spring classes and in exchange requires removal of all tents except for except for aid and restricts the demonstration area to allow uh, only students, faculties and staff unless the university approves otherwise. At the University of Southern California, organisers of a large encampment sat down with University President Carol Fault for about 90 minutes on Monday. Fault declined to discuss details of what was discussed but said the purpose of the meeting was to allow her to hear the concerns of protesters. USC sparked a controversy on April the 15th when officials refused to allow the valid issuance who have publicly supported Palestinians to make a commit uh, comm commitment speech, citing non-specific security concerns for the rare decision. Administrations then scrapped the keynote speech by filmmaker John M. Shu, who is anonymous and declined to award any ordinary degrees. The backlash as well as Columbia's demonstrators inspired the encampment and protesters on campus last week, where 90 people were arrested by police in riot gear. The university has can cancelled its main graduation event that typically draws 65,000 people to the Los Angeles campus. The students said at the the students said at the end they wouldn't have considered this meeting a win from their perspective, and I can fully appreciate that. Fault said in a statement late Monday. For me, the most important point was we were starting to talk, and I think that was vital. Another meeting between uh, Fault and protesters was scheduled for Tuesday, so they would have had that today by the time you guys see this. Administrations elsewhere tried to salvage 
their commencements and several had ordered the clearing of encampments in recent days. Where those efforts have failed, officials threatened discipline, including suspension and possible arrest. But students dug in their heels in other Hopal universities, with standoffs continued at Harvard, the University of Pennsylvania, Yale and others. Police in riot gear at Virginia Commonwealth University sought to break up an encampment there late Monday, clashing with protesters and deploying pepper spray and zip ties to take them into custody. Jacob Ginn, a second year University of North Carolina societal graduate student, said he had been protesting at the encampment for four days, including negotiations with administrators on Friday. We are prepared for everything and we will remain here until the university meets our demands and we will remain steadfast and strong in the face of any brutality and repression that they try to attack us with, Jen said in the reference to polit potential police sweep of the encampment. They want to sever that. They want these campuses to sever ties to anything associated with the Israeli government. That's what they want to do. They, they want to sever the, they want these campuses to have no association with, with the government of Israel. That is just not going to happen. If I'm absolutely honest, guys, I just don't I like that. That's kind of what they want to do. They really want to sever America with, they want to sever America with, 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 with Israel as much as they possibly can. And this is one of their ways of doing that. And I just can't see that happening. I understand. I, I get it. I get I get what they're doing and, and I've said this before, they're in there guys. I know I know how they feel and I and I, I generally do feel that. Um but it's just I just don't know where the line is. You know, it's it's a difficult it's a difficult position it's difficult for them because you know they they feel very strongly about this and 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 I feel very strongly about this too about what's happening in in in, in Israel and Hamas the Israel Hamas war I feel very strongly about it too I really do um I, I totally understand their point of view but is there is there not a line they are crossing is the question that I, I think is worth asking I think that's worth a question asking guys um but I will try to keep an eye on it and I'll try to update you guys on short videos whenever I possibly can. So we're going to move on um, to Africa, guys. So as you guys know, one of the one conflict that always that's been taking place in Africa, one that I've continuously covered here on this channel and even on Rumble has been what's happening with Sudan. So I've got this one here is from Al Jazeera. So Sudan's original Jadawid leader sides with the army against the tribal foe. Sudan's notorious tribal leader, uh, Musta Halijis, has pledged support for the army in a move that could divide Arab tribes in Dalfar. So, this, um, so, as you guys know, may or may not know, there are many different tribes, there are many different, uh, like, mini factions, shall we say, uh, and tribe, tribes within Sudan. And I think what is happening, uh, for those who have been keeping up, obviously this conflict's been going on for more than a war now between for more than a year now between uh, the Sudetian Armed Forces and the Rapid Support Forces. Um, I think what has happened, transpired as, as time has passed, yeah, the Rapid Support Forces have, have destroyed many, many, um, many villages, many uh, uh, reports of genocide and, and so-called ethnic cleansing that has been done by them, allegedly some uh, humongous, some rape and murder pillaging that they have caused. And I think despite the fact that there are many tribes and many factions out there who don't agree with the army or don't want any association with the army whatsoever, are literally putting their differences aside to join with the army to, 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 to stop the rapid support forces and the damage that they're causing to their country. Um, and I think that's, that's kind of the decision. That's why the Jadawid leader has sided with the army against the tribal foe. And I think that's why this, this has occurred. But let's read into it. So, in a new twist in Sudan's civil war, a notorious tribal chief has re-emerged from obscurity to support the army. So, named Musta Hali, he is the original leader of the nomadic, also referred to as Arab tribe militias, known as the Jawanawid, uh, responsible for the atrocities during the Darfur war that started in 2003. So, in that war, Hali fought alongside Mohammed Hamdan Hendi Dango as part of the Sudanese government war on Sudetan farming tribes referred to as non-Arab tribes that had rebelled against the state. Of more than 300,000 people were killed due to the armed conflict as well as disease and famine brought onto the war according to the United Nations. 
But more than two decades later, Hemley finds himself embroiled into another conflict, heading in heading the paramilitary rapid support forces, which grew out of the Jawanawid in an accidental fight against the Sudanese armed forces. Last week, Hadi broke his silence in the now year-long conflict, telling his supporters that he stands with the army and added he had been asked by local tribes to prioritise state stability and peace. He was also reported to have criticised the RDF for actions the force is accused of committing, such as rape and looting. And Hadi and Habadi are both from the nomadic uh, Ratsketch tribe, but Hadi is also a a respected tribal leader with sub-tribe Muhammad Branch giving him some local status over Hemdili. Most nomadic tribes in Dafa have thrown their support behind the RSF, leading recruits, uh, local knowledge and access to vital supply lines. It's drawing more 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 sides are drawing picking out being forced to kind of pick sides in this as this continues here. Um these are Sudetan uh, certainly soldiers from the Raptor Sport Forces stand on top of Vehicle during a military backed rally in Malo district south of Khartoum. There, but given that Hadley's stand status, his announcement could undercut Henry's support base and risk triggering in fighting between nomadic tribes, according to experts and sources close to his clan. Some believe that Hadley's move could be an attempt to regain political relevance in Dafar. Hattie doesn't have a lot of supporters compared to Hemudi right now, but he can collect a lot, said Sami Hoster, a member of the Mahamudi clan, with relatives close to Hadi and Hawidi, and herself a relative of Hemudi, despite her fierce criticism of the RSF. What's clear is that the army and Hemudi reached an agreement where Hadi and his supporters will receive a certain amount of money, material and weapons, she added. In 2003, the army outsourced a counterinsurgency to Hadley and his followers. They were paid and they were paid and armed to fight non-Arab armed groups who were revolting against the government's marginalization of their tribes and region. Hadley's forces committed summary executions, burned Italian villages to the ground, and used rape as a weapon of war, according to Human Rights Watch. His, low, his tribal militias uh, became known colloquially as the Jawanawid, which means the devils on horsebacks in Sudanic. Sudanese Arabic. As a reward for crushing the insurgency, Sudan's uh, autocrat former president Omar al Bashir appointed Halidi as his special advisor in 2008. But he grew disillusioned with al Bashir and believed that he was not interested in rewarding him for crushing a rebellion or developing Dafar. So he left Khartoum angry and returned to Dafar five years later. In 20 uh, 2014, Hattie known formed his own ar- armed movement, the Revolutionary Awakening Council, which al Basir assures a threat to his rule. The ex-president countered by appointing Hemley as leader of the RSF, which was later tasked with disarming the resisting Hali and his sons in 2017. Yeah, this is uh, this is quite a lot, isn't it? Hadi's project was to unify the Dalfos tribes against Khartoum, and Al Bashir resented so that he could turn it into something big against him. That's why he immediately uh, tried to divide the Arab tribes by sending the RSF after him, said uh, Somalin Berko, the founder of the Sudanese Sudan's uh, Transparency and Policy Tracker, a think tank covering political affairs in the country. Months after the army and RSF upended Sudan's frail democratic transition in October in 2021. They released Hajo and he kept a low profile even after SAF leader Adal Farid um, al Badin and Hemdi turned on each other to ignite the Sudan civil war in April of last year. But in February of this year, they have kept a low profile since the start of the war. Hadley allegedly promised Hemdi that he would remain neutral in exchange for the equivalent of 750,000. Uh, as well as local journalists and sources from within the Rajakich tribe and RSF who did not wish to be named. At the tribal level, there was a kind of reconciliation, but now we have the video Baldur told Al Jazeera, referring to footage showing Haiti pledging his support for the army. In the weeks leading up to Sudan's civil war, activists said the military intelligence tried to recruit uh, Rasagi's fighters into the new militia to undercut Hemili's tribal base, which he relies on for fighters and logistical support. Al Jazeera believed that military intelligence is doubling down on its divide and conquer tactics through cooperating Hadley. He said that Hadley and his former ties to promote members of Sudan's political Islamic movement, which are collectively known as the Kizing. The Kizing ruled under al-Bashir for three decades and have speculated to have a number of senior officers at the security forces, including in military intelligence. The plan of the Islamic movement in Sudan is to divide Arab tribes, and that is the goal Hono told al-Jazeera. 
it is in the interest of military intelligence to split the Arabs of Darfur to find ways to get them to fight each other. This is consistent historically with the strategy of military intelligence, added Abaldo. Haladi's announcement has already generated division and backlash among Rekhachi's tribe leaders. In a video uploaded and then deleted from Facebook, a Muhammad chief said that Haiti did not represent his clan's position and that Muhammad in West Darfur was firmly behind the RSF. The RSF is interested in bringing freedom, justice and fairness to us all, the Mabadi tribal leader had said. The army is also using a criminal and butcher, uh, the army is also a criminal, a butcher and a killer and in the past used all of its violence against us. Let me be clear, both sides, like the RSF have been more horrible than the, the army, but the army has its own guilt to be fair as well. But I, I really do despise both this, this civil war for happening in the first place. Earlier this month, several non-Arab armed movements declared war on the RSF after relinquishing their new neutrality in North Darfur. The RSF and the Lion militias responded by burning down at least 15 mostly non-Arab villages in west of Al Fashir, according to Darfur Network of Human Rights. The army has also indiscriminately bombed Ossiad RSF positions, killing dozens of civilians. The mounting violence has sparked fears that the all-out tribal conflict could erupt in North Darfur. The tense situation has compelled Hadi to side with the army to protect his tribal supporters from ethnically motivated attacks, according to Ahmed Jua, a local journalist from Dafar. I think he's trying to protect his Mamahid tribe from possible tribal clashes. Now he's on the side as the non-Arab armed movements. He will restore some calm and balance, a goal told Al Jazeera. Mohammed Fado El Yussi, the founder of the local outlet Dafar24, agrees, but he believes that Hadi is also trying to stop his army's indiscriminately bombing of his community. He told that his position to ally with the army so that the bombs from the war planes would stop hitting his areas, he told Al Jazeera. Yeah, I, I think, like, given, like, he's obviously, he's had a lot of ties to this, the history here as well. Um, and uh, you, they were going to get, you were going to get caught into this one way or another. Yeah, you know, given that what's been happening, and in, and like I said before, guys, there's no sign of any peace whatsoever in this. There's been no sign of any peace talks whatsoever in this in this all as well. Bado also believes that Haiti's decision was predictable, arguing that he was never accepted to play fiddle to Hemdedi. Heidi was seen as someone who is more senior and legitimate as a tribal chief, and Hemdedi does not claim to be the tribal chief on any level. He told Al Jazeera, "In that category, Hemdedi is far above Hemdedi. He would never." So he would never join the RSF. So yeah, another. It's a quite a big. It's quite big considering the influence that he has and and the the, the tribes that he has. Uh, Musta Haliti, um, joining the army and obviously that it's also going to create stoke divisions within the RSF. But is it going to make a you know? Is this going to make a, a difference? We'll have to wait and see. Obviously, time will tell. I will try to keep an up to date with what's going on in in the war, but still, many many people have been displaced, many lives have been lost. Um, there's a lot of tribes, a lot of factions, a lot of religion tied into what's happening in Sudan, and um, there was a obviously I've talked about this in the past, but there was a point where it looked like a government of some sorts, a civilized government, was going to be formed, but that's not the situation we're in now, unfortunately. Um, I, I, at the moment, I still don't know where the end is going to be for this. It's just, it just seems like a consistently ongoing conflict, and it's a real shame, guys. It really, really is. Um, just so you guys know, the um, the gang is here. Um, Ollie doesn't like talking about Sudan. He thinks it's very depressing. I know it's depressing talking about what's happening there. Um, we don't, you know, because not enough people talk about what's happening in Sudan. Ollie's um. Yeah, Ollie doesn't like it. Pingu's not too fussed about it, to be fair. Um, because Pingu says it's really important to talk about. And it is important to talk about. So, guys, just before I go to the next article, if you haven't already, please hit the like button. We greatly appreciate it. Share it across social media so others are notified of this video. And subscribe because it really does help support the channel. Um, so, anyone who does any of that is greatly appreciated. It really does help the channel boost the algorithm. Gets more eyes on this, so I to continue to provide news, not just in the UK, but stuff around the world too. So I thank you to everyone who does do that. It is greatly appreciated. So we are sticking a little bit with Sudan, but not completely with it. Um, hold on a second. Why is this one? Oh, there we go. 
um what screen was that so the next one i've got for you guys is it's not it's not on sudan but it's it's tied to it and this one is from middle eastern i so the headline is the united Arab emirates a council meeting with uk ministers in a spat over the sudan war so abu dhabi has been angered after the uk did not defend it as sudan's un representatives accused the emirates of supporting the rapid support forces so there has been a row building between the uk and the united Arab emirates the uk generally believes that the united Arab emirates is supporting the rapid support forces they have denied this on numerous occasions so the uk are obviously saying well that well they obviously uk's intelligence services must be saying something different um, but this is what's happening here so the british government are basically saying that that the UAE are supporting the rapid support forces. These are the same rapid support forces that have we've heard many evidences, and st I've heard many evidence and stories of them. Obviously, and we've discussed this in the past with regards to the Sudan War of them doing uh, causing absolute atrocities here. Um, <coughs> so, why would the UAE support, uh, support the RSF? Well, let's read more into the, all this, guys. So. The United Arab Emirates has cancelled a number of meetings with UK ministers after the Emirates was accused of aiding the paramilitary waging group waging war in Sudan. Earlier this month, the United Nations Security Council held a meeting about Sudan's civil war, which broke out a year ago at the request of the UK. During that session, Sudan's representatives accused the UAE of providing backing to the rapid support forces, the RSF paramilitary group, a change in which Abu Dhabi has denied. According to a report in the Times on Sunday, four ministerial meetings have been cancelled by the Emirates who were reportedly angered by the British not jumping to UAE's defence at the Security Council. The development came just days after the Guardian reported that the UK itself had been holding secret talks with the RSF. Yeah, it's quite... Yeah, there was also that story that I covered um, that the Guardian had... that the UK had been holding secret talks with the RSF as well. And I was like, what's all that about as well? So, that was a cause for concern as well. So I've, I'm not sure why they've been holding those talks. And uh, clearly the United Arab Emirates are really angry because they're, kind of, they're basically saying uh, it's really angry and I don't blame them for if that's the case because they've been accused of something. They've blatantly denied it. Clearly there may have been case the United Arab Emirates may be working with the RSF but we don't know that for sure. But it's entirely possible that it may be. But why... Uh, uh, there's a lot of questions here. Sorry, I'm just getting a bit of reflux. I apologise. But what, what's the angle here by the UK doing this? So the RSF have been in war with Sudan and his armed forces since April the 15th last year. The war has displaced over 8 million people and left 18 million food security is insecure, according to the UN Food Report. Uh, a report released in mid-April by the Rado Wahlberg Center concluded that a genocide was taking place against non-Arab groups in Sudan's Dafar region at the hands of the RSF and aligned militias. It stated that there was clear and convincing evidence that Sudan, the UAE, Libya, Chad, the Central African Republic and Russia, by the actions of the Wagner group, were complicit in the genocide. Khartoum has called for an emergency meeting at the Security Council over the UAE's backing of the RSF, according to a report in AFP on Saturday. If the UAE is so adamant that their denials uh, denials that they are supporting the RSF, then why spend so much diplomatic capital to prevent the discussion? Cameron Hodgson, a former CIA analyst and senior associate at the CSIS African program, told Middle East and I. Hudson said that sources familiar with the matter told him that the UAE was pressuring the US and UK and other security councils to cancel the emergency meeting. In Washington, this is bringing it to a head dispute between African Africanists who want to take a hard line in on the UAE's behaviour in Sudan. And the Biden administration's Middle East uh, policy team led by Brett McCook, who have resisted using their leverage with the UAE over Sudan, he said. MEE have reported on the network of supply lines that exist to funnel arms and other goods from the UAE to the rapid support forces via ally groups and governments in Libya, Chad and the Central African Republic. The UAE is the Sudanese paramilitary main partner, with the supplies of arms to the RSF also facilitated by Libyan commander Khalif Haldar, and running overland from Chad and the CAR, as well as being flown out of air bases in Uganda. The paramilitary forces has denied that it's been supplied by the UAE and rejected accusations that it's waging war and ethically motivated campaign of violence in Dufar. Responding to Sudan's accusations at the UN Security Council, Abu Dhabi had said, The United Arab Emirates unequivocally rejects the baseless allegations made by the permanent representatives of Sudan 
which runs counter to the long-standing brotherly relations between the, our two countries, and regrettably appears to be nothing more than an attempt to divert attention from the conflict and the dire humanitarian situation con caused by the ongoing fight. All allegations of the United Arab Emirates' involvement in any form of aggression in the destabilization of Sudan or its provision of any military, logistical, financial or political support to any faction in Sudan are speculative, unfounded and lack any credible evidence to support them. In December, Sudan demanded that 15 Emirate di diplomats leave the country after the army commander accused the UAE of supporting the RSF. That was back in December. Over the weekend, the Security Council expressed deep concerns over an attack on Al-Fashir in the Dolphar region by the paramilitary group. The UN officials warned that 800,000 people in Al-Fashir, the largest major city in Dolphar, not under RSF control, were extreme and immediate danger. And this this uh, this was this story was yes was also on yesterday as well. This one, so. Are the United Arab Emirates backing the RSF? I don't know, um, but clearly, they clearly Sudan are convinced they are, and Great Britain obviously had apparently had secret talks with the Guardian, and I think I did cover it in the Snowflake Corner episode. I don't remember the UK government denying that they had talks with the RSF as well. Why they had talked to the RSF, I don't know. I'm going to go out on a limb and say it was something to do with about trying to negotiate some kind of uh, talks or something. Perhaps I could be wrong. Um, I don't know what the angle was from from, from that, um, based on my knowledge of what we we'll remember there. there. But um, if ever like Sudan clearly are, are saying that they're working, and UAE are firmly denying this. The people are saying that they they're supplying weapons and whatnots through other means through other countries in order to get it into to the RSF hands. So the question I suppose you need to be asking yourself: so why are the UAE doing doing this? Well, it comes down to obviously uh, the his the hit the the history uh, of of this conflict is obviously playing as a part of this as well. But but um, I just uh, I think it's 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 an interesting point of view. They're claiming that the UAE have been trying to stop any kind of, of meetings or whatnot with, uh, with the in as well about this as well. So that's not a very good sign. If it's not a very good sign, if the UAE are, are, are basically allegedly trying to stop meetings and talk about this, while at the same time, and then the UK is kind of like UK and UAE have always had a, a had a pretty decent relationship, shall we say? Definitely not 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 right now. That is for sure. But. We will have to wait and see, obviously, how things progress there. But uh, a, a fascinating one, to say the least, you guys. So this next uh, story I've got for you guys is a short one before we take a little break. Uh, this one is from CNA. This is from Central uh, News Asia. Um, Bangladesh again shut schools due to heat wave. So as we, as we are in spring and eventually we'll hit into the summertime, as you guys know, this ties into climate change, obviously, because... Temperatures continue to increase, and it becomes a situation where it comes gets to certain temperatures. It's such a point where people are unable to 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 to, to work in certain set, certain areas, or uh, unable to to go to school or whatever the education because of the the, the situation that they're in. But uh, as we're about to read, the temperatures are quite hot, shall we say? So I would I so anyone who thinks that this that Bangladesh can't uh, can simply handle that. Well, when you look at the temperatures, you can under understand why Bangladesh are shutting these schools down again during the heat waves. So Bangladesh again closed all primary schools across the country and educational institutions. Almost half of the district, including the capital, as severe heat waves saw temperatures climb above 43 degrees Celsius on Monday. Schools across the country that closed last week due to the heat wave reopened on Sunday, despite persistent high temperatures across the South Asian nation, which resulted in lower attendance. Classes of all government primary schools will remain closed until Thursday in educational institutes, and 27 out of 64, including the capital Dhaka, will remain closed on Tuesday, the educational minister, ministry has said on Monday. Now, clearly, the government of Bangladesh needs to do something to get to make these classrooms, make the environment much cooler. For them, um, they need to sort out as soon as possible because this is severely damaging the education of future Bangladesh children, the next generation, by not being able to be in school. Yes, of course, I understand the temperatures. So they need to address this in the buildings. Um, that means putting their the states putting their hands in their pockets in order to do so. 
But if that's what needs to be done in order for them to get the education that they need, that is what needs to be done. So the Education Minister, Marwal Hussain uh, Chawi Nafal, said on Sunday that if the temperature in any district exceeds 42 degrees Celsius, the educational institutions in those districts will be closed. Scientists have said climate change is contrib contributing to more frequent, severe and uh, lengthy heat waves during the summer months. This month in Bangladesh, there's been a heat wave every day except the 9th of April and 10th. Authorities have encouraged citizens to stay indoors during the day. Yeah, these, this is just out. These temperatures are just extreme. Extremely high temperatures. I remember, guys, we're only literally just on the edge of April going into May. We're not even in the summertime yet. That's, that's the worst thing. But for those working who work outdoors, the rich shore diver, Mohammed Shamin, there is not much respite. It's too hard to work under the sun during a brutal heat wave. There are not many people who are coming out, which means getting in passengers is tough, but we have no option but to come out and work, Shamin had said. Like showing tens of thousands of rickshaw operators in Dhaka are suffering in the scorching sun, trying to find work while most people are chose to stay inside. I would never experience such heat in my life. Yes, summer should be hot, but it would never have been, uh, been gusts of winds and rain. It's not happening at this time. People are suffering a lot, he said. Yeah, it's um, no, it's not it's not just obviously the schools. It's it's just society itself when temperatures are reaching such such difficult um, temperatures have reached such crucial heights it's not good for your health as well and it can also develop you know those heated temperatures can also develop potentially skin cancer as well if, you, if, you're, if you're not covered up as well properly so it's a very very worrying time and you know we're talking about you know the temperatures around the world are, are going are increasing we know that they're increasing and I'm really not looking forward to the summer whatsoever um, with these heat waves coming, guys. I really am not. And Bangladesh already experiencing it there. I mean, they're only going to get worse before they get better. And um, my heart goes out to the the, 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 the next generation because they're, they're going to suffer as a result of this. Their education has been hampered as a result of these heat waves. You know, once these temperatures reach a certain certain threshold, it's a case of, right, we can't, we can't, we can't teach them in these conditions. It's just too much. No matter how much water you put in front of them, um, the heat can be, you know, can make you hot, sweaty. It can make you feel nausea. It just it can, won't let you concentrate on what's in front of you. There's lots of reasons why it's, you know, the heat, why you're, you're unable to focus on the job at hand unless you're in at least a decent, um, decent c conditions to be able to do so, as well as being fed and slept well as well for the children. So, uh, lots of other factors that take place in too. So. Yeah, not good here whatsoever, guys. Um, what's that? Uh, yes, yes, it is time for a funny video, uh, Ollie, yeah. Uh, Pingu uh, says, um, wanted me to remind you guys that if you haven't already, please consider becoming a YouTube member. Yes, 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 of course. Yeah, Pingu says, obviously, being a YouTube member really does support uh, this channel, supports me, supports Ollie, supports uh, Pingu and Cash Dummy. And by being a YouTube member, you get access to custom emojis. Like, uh, so you can actually, uh, so we've got emojis of Ollie, happy Ollie, sad Ollie, Pingu, Pingu and Ollie together, uh, Cash Dummy, they're hiding behind them all, as well as the lava lamp and the orb. And all it. So, um, I thought for a second my mic had turned off, it didn't. Um, but um, yeah, uh, anyone who becoming a YouTube member, if doing so for 99p really does make a difference you can also access 299 membership where you get early access to membership content as well and once i upload it and it passes any monetization issues uh, it becomes available for you guys as well at the moment just i wanted to report as well this week this week we have some exclusive uh videos on the members channel guys for a limited time so do check them out uh, whenever you get the chance as well um any super chats are welcome buy me a coffees are welcome um, but the best way to support the channel is I've becoming a YouTube member. The other way you can financially, one of the other good ways you can financially support me, and I greatly appreciate those who are, is becoming a Patreon supporter. Being a Patreon supporter gets you access to some exclusive content on my Patreon uh, community on there, as well as you get access to uh, the our political content that I have available only on there as well. So thank you to everyone who has done that. It is greatly appreciated. So, guys, let's take a little break uh, from the news. I've got a funny video for you guys here. 
It's another foil and arms. I know you guys like your foil and arms videos. Um, this one here for you guys <clears throat> is entitled Every School Careers Advisor. Hope you guys enjoy. Mr. Lawless. Mr. Lawless. <clears throat> um, Gavin Graham. Yes. yes. You must have some idea what you want to do, you know? Must um, be something. I've, I've got like a vague idea. Project management? It doesn't get bigger than that. What is that? Is Nobody it? knows. Okay. I've seen you in the corridors. You're yeah. pretty noisy. Okay. Yeah? How about a leaf blower? Uh, no, thank you. No. Okay. No. Well, it's okay. You don't. No. Not everything is. Uh, I, I, you know, when you came in, you, you threw your bag into the corner of the room, and I just thought, baggage handler. You know. What okay. What are you kind of basing this on? The job market at the moment, very diverse. How do you think I got this job by giving good career advice to people? Yeah. No, I got this job because I was deemed unfit for a classroom environment. I'm gonna be honest with you, okay? I have lost your aptitude test. I have a copy. Could you? You are in the 85th percentile for space relations. Yeah. Okay. So mm. have you thought maybe about um, becoming an astronaut? It doesn't mean that. No. Yeah, well, I. Are yes, liaising with the astronauts. No. Uh, relations of it's their. Not, it's not that. 75th percentile in clerical speed and accuracy. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> but the looks of things, you could be a cleric. And a bloody fast one at that. I, I really would like to go to university if, if I could. Hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Would you like some schnapps? I'm 16. Would you mind if I had some? It's just, uh, I'm really getting into schnapps lately. So, careers, big decisions, life. Yeah. Okay, so has anyone ever told you you're not going to amount to anything? No. That's a pity because those people tend to do very well. <sighs> um, cause I'm, I'm doing good in, in woodwork, so maybe like a, what a, a trade. So top that dirty. <laughs> what are you doing? Well, if you didn't like that prank, you're, you're never going to make it in the trades. You don't know what you're talking about. Okay, I would say that that is lunch. It's ten fifteen. Yeah, well, I had a late breakfast and. Um... Thanks, Bill. What are you doing in here? Um, we let you go months ago. I have nowhere else to go. Could you please leave? I, can, can you just give me a few more days? It's, it's very difficult to, to try and Out. find a job that suits me. Yeah. Out now. Fine. Fine. Best career advisor we ever had. It's terrible. Yeah. I know. Doom -da. <laughs> what on earth did I just watch? Oh dear, oh dear. Uh, so what do you want to be when you grow up? I don't know. Uh, don't ever ask me what, uh, what that conversation was like for me because I honestly don't remember. Oh dear, but do check out the YouTube channel for your arms guys. Give their videos a like. Um, link for the uh, link for it will be in the description if you guys want to check it out yourself. Um, but yeah, they always have some funny videos for you guys. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Excuse me. So the let's move on, guys. So the next um, uh, why is this not? Uh, there we go. I think that's the right one. Yeah, that is the right one. So the next one I got for you guys is from CNN. And um, this is, um, I really don't like this story at all. This is very worrying to say the least. I mean, so Goldemans prosecutors have raided the Save the Children's Office over migration children's complaint. So uh, Goldemans prosecutors, let me repeat that just for those. So Goldemans uh, prosecutors have raided a Save the Children's Office over migrant children complaint. Raiding a Save the Children's uh, offices. Um, what? Like, this is quite shocking. Um, I really hope they have legitimate reasons for doing this. Um, if not, this is quite horrifying, to say the least, guys. Um, you know, Save the Children are great. They do wonderful work here. So what are their offices being raided for? I don't like this at all, guys. 
So Gardermund authorities raided the offices of NGO Safety Children on Thursday, citing complaints over the treatment of Guatemalan children in Texas, the country's prosecute, uh, public prosecutor had told CNN. The raid was carried out by authorities from the special public prosecutor against impunity and the civil police, the government lawyers have said, after an investigation was opened into the treatment of migrant uh, children in Texas shelters. The public prosecutor received a complaint referring and highlighting instances regarding Goldman's children and teenagers being subjected to vulnerabilities in shelter in Texas. Connected with a network which involves NGOs that operate in the United States and Guantanamo, a spokesperson for the public prosecutor's office, uh, John Lewis Platon, had said. Platon said the raid was to gather information for the investigation. It included document searches and seizures, the prosecutor's office said on X. The complaint was filed in Guantanamo, but authorities requested the help of the Texan Authority General Office since some of the shelters allegedly involved are located there. Save the Children, a British organisation to help minors in distress and humanitarian crisis, said in a statement that it was not giving any specific accusations and there is no evidence to pull any accusations of improper conduct. It added that the organisation uh, does not facilitate and never have any transfer of children or teenagers out of uh, Golomanda. Save the Children also said they answers to the UK's Charity Commission, which has its books audited annually. The Guatemalans prosecute is for impunity. Raphael uh, Crunchesi said the case is transnational and of great uh, transcendence involving several organisations. Uh, Crunchy himself has sanctioned, uh, was sanctioned by the European Council last February with assets, freezes and listed among those responsible for undermining democracy, the rule of law and his peaceful transfer of power in Guatemala. He's among other Central American officials who have been sanctioned with their visa denial or cancellation for allegedly undermining democracy and the rule of law, including obstructing and corrupting uh, obstructing corruption investigations and raising spurious claims against other officials, according to a 2022 report to Congress by the U.S. Department of State. Crunchy Lee has not responded to several requ requests for comment by CNN, but at the time he said to local media that he did not care about Washington's sanctions, and he called the U.S. Uh, the EU measures laughable. Guantanamo's president, uh, current president Bar Barnano Alva, an anti-corrupt figure who defied the odds and won the election last year in a landslide, has promised to empower the judiciary. He has, however, been constrained by the Guantanamo prosecutor's office, led by U.S. Sanctuary Attorney General Cosido Potes, that has made two requests to withdraw his immunity and is accused of attempting to disqualify the results of his election. Guantanamo Attorney General's office has not responded to CNN's multiple requests uh, for response to these accusations. What exactly is where? So is this in? This is in Texas. This is yeah, migrant children in Texas shelter. So this is in Texas, apparently. So it's just they were after certain documents, apparently. Apparently, but still, um, like what exactly have saved the children done here? Is is like is what I'm trying to trying to comprehend this is this is the only report i have on this guy by the way guys i've not seen any other reports if anyone has any other reports regarding this can you please uh let me know on the can please post on the discord community because i'm generally want to know a bit more about this um this is very kind of cause for concern like i don't know the reasons behind enough enough about this is there's not enough information here for me to to know exactly what this is, but it's still a great deal of cause of concern that I saved the children's offices has been raided. Um, I don't, I don't understand the reason behind it. Like, not enough information has been, not enough information has been been gathered there, guys. But if you if you do happen to find more information, please let me know because I'm generally concerned about about it. I'll try and keep my eye out uh, on CNN and others news outlets on it. That is for sure, guys. Moving back away from America, we're going all the way to Australia here. An interesting one uh, from them. This one is from The Guardian. The headline is Australia urged to impose big tech tax to fund trusted media and fight disinformation. Think tank cast uh, detrogation and the information environment as a foreign policy priority as a threat to social cohesion. Um, this is something like I think should be done. A big tech tax um, to kind of make things more difficult for you know, make make it difficult for social medias. Um, you know, 
don't give social medias all the power and influence. Um, how, like I'd like to, I hope that the idea behind this is for the benefit of its people and not just a case of just having more influence over the next generation of Australians in their country. And um, I do think there needs to be more to protect people and younger generations from social media. So more needs to be done there to help fight the disinformation because we have a lot of disinformation out there as well. So I'm all for, for tackling disinformation. Um, so hopefully this is within the interest of the people of Australia. So Australia has been urged to hit a big tech companies with a new digital platform tax uh, to fund the trusted news media in order to confront the rising tide of misinformation and disinformation. So Australia's defence budget commits billions to buffer against military threats, but the country is unprepared to fend off malicious actors looking for any chance to wage information warfare, according to the Asian Pacific Development Diplomacy and Defence Dialogue, the AP4D think tank. An, op an options paper published by them on Tuesday said uh, new ideas should be considered because previous effects to address the, new the news media's financial woes regulating social media companies and make them pay for news have faltered. The recommendations include the need to educate citizens in Australia on how to spot in misinformation and disinformation and also to fund independent journalism across the Pacific. Meta, the parent company of Facebook and Instagram, has announced it will no longer make payments to news companies in Australia as the three-year contracts uh, struck to avoid being regulated under the news media bargaining code began to expire. And Jessica Kaspis, an advisor to the AP4D and one of the editors of the option paper, said Meta's decision could take $70 million out of commercial news and public broadcasting in Australia. Kepa said this left a trusted news outlet staring down the barrel of yet another crisis. She said malicious actors were taking advantage of information vacuums left by shuttered or curtailed news operations both in Australia and the region, as well as lax tax as well as lax social media regulations to undermine social cohesion. The options paper said it was time to consider other measures such as special digital platform tax, the revenue of which could be channeled towards news. The paper is not uh, prescribed about the size of the scope of his proposed tax, but says most disinformation is delivered by multinational social media and tech platforms and their business models depend on generating maximum engagement through context engineered to cause shock and outrage. Australia is facing a deep decline in information sovereignty because of the growing power of a handful of global companies that operate global information infrastructure monopolies in social media, data, AI, satellite technology and cloud computing. The paper acknowledges it is difficult for a country of Australia's size to influence big commercial players like Google, TikTok, X and Meta, but suggests trying to influence standard in cooperation with the US and EU. The paper says allocating revenue from a digital platform, uh, digital platform tax to fund Australian journalism must be done in a way that does not entrench existing news organisations and information monopolies, but encourages new players to emerge. Complementary policies include in tax incentives for news producers and philanthropic support. Not-for-profit or employee-owned corporate structures for media companies should be modelled and encouraged, the paper has also said. The most well-known of these is the Scots Trust, which owns The Guardian. These kinds of trusts could be replicated in Australia to provide stable base funding and freedom from political interference. The paper suggests policymakers could also tackle the demand in size for the form of government funding for new subscriptions that are distributed to the, the basis of means testing. Given the most credible news is now only accessible through prohibited paywalls, restoring public access to diverse and accurate news sources has also become a critical issue, the paper says. Media industry woes are looking at one part of the AP4D paper, which titled What Does It Look Like for Australia to Use All Tools and Statecraft in the Information Environment? The paper says Australia should commit to more resources to protecting civilians from harm of the information environment through long-term, well-funded and ongoing public literacy campaigns. It calls for the digital media uh, literacy to be taught from early childhood onwards to help children and young adults build resilience against the many harms targeted at them in the information environment. The paper casts the degradation and the information environment as an urgent foreign policy priority for the Australian people at a time when China is seeking to increase its influence across the Pacific. Australia's Pacific broadcasting strategy still spends less than one Australian dollar per capita compared to Japan, which spends roughly four pound four dollar and fifty on overseas broadcasting, and Germany, which spends seven dollars per person. It says the paper was produced as part of a program funded by the Australian Civil Military Centre, but does not represent gov uh, Australian government policy.
so it's not a policy but it, it is something that they are that is an idea of something of talking about there's something to help combat the disinformation disinformation in australia um we here in the uk need to have something uh to help combat disinformation because we are flooded with it right now um without a shadow of a doubt there needs to be more I agree with a lot of things that's, that it says that more needs to be done to protect current media and also to encourage new progressive medias out there as well. But sometimes we don't always know the right way of doing it or how the how to best um, to best uh, tackle uh, best tackle them as well. It's, it's 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 difficult, guys. It can be difficult to 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 do that. There, there is, in my opinion, I don't see like there is. The clear right uh, way to deal with it. I'm I'm not sure what the 100% uh, the clearest of paths in order to deal to deal with that. But it is something that uh, be interesting to see if Australia uh, pursue something like this. But it is also something that the UK and other nations should continue to look at to in order to protect to protect themselves and disinformation. Obviously, has been the main talk. Obviously, in America, has been about TikTok. Um, and about banning TikTok outright, I don't think I don't think that's right. I don't think it's banning TikTok outright. Um, they see it as like uh, some kind of spying state, and they're just like what TikTok are doing with their short feeds and whatnot is no different, in my opinion, than what Facebook are doing with their feeds on there. What Instagram are doing with their feeds, with what even YouTube shorts are doing with their feeds on there. I don't see much of a time in difference it just depends on what the algorithm reads that that's just kind of my how i see it but maybe some people will disagree but but yeah the combat the the battling of disinformation is continuing you guys so <clears throat> before uh before we wrap things up guys we're going to be going looking at to the current conflict in ukraine looking at the kiev independent and the state uh, map guys but uh, just a reminder if you haven't already please hit the like button and share this across social media so others might have this video and subscribe because it really does help support the channel supports me supports ollie supports um pingu here uh, cash dummy is hiding behind there and the lava lamp is starting to form hopefully it will finish completely forming uh by the time we reach the end of the show here guys so let's look at the latest going on in the war in Ukraine, and we go to the Kiev Independent, one of the more one of the more reliable sources there. So this is one of the latest there. So there was an attack, a uh, Russian attack in Kharkiv that killed two and injured six. So there's been an update since then. This is one of the attacks that took place late yesterday evening, and uh, I updated this. I just updated this this morning just to see uh, what is being said here. <clears throat> And uh, this is the developing story being updated just for reference. So I may do an updated short version on this story. So a Russian airstrike against two districts in the northeastern city of Kharkov on April the 30th killed at least two people and injured at least six, the mayor Igor Tologos has said. So Russian forces reportedly targeted Kaskovsky and Kalorovsky districts in the city, hitting residential areas, according to the mayor. The governor, Ola Shosky, reported that Russia is likely attacking the city using KAB aerial bombs. Further details and consequences of the attack are being determined. Russia has recently intensified its attacks against Ukraine's second largest city, dealing multiple casualties and severe damage to Kharkov energy infrastructure. This is the second day in a row that Russia has dropped KAB bombs on Kharkov on April 29th. Solibor said that Russian uh, forces bombed the Kalavi district of the city there. So this has been an ongoing ongoing uh, for quite a while here. Another terrible um, story here, guys, as well. Another Russian attack against Ukraine killed seven and injured at least 36 over the past day. Oh. So a Russian attack in Ukraine killed seven people and injured 36 over the past day, regional authorities had said on the early of today. Uh, that's 30th April for reference. As a Russia targeted a total of 10 Ukrainian on blasts, Zaporizhia, Kalorysky, Chekovic, Molorysky, Luskitz, Damorysky, Sumer, Oskar, Kershkin, Karlov, which we just covered, and Donetsk casualties were reported in the later four regions. Russia carried out a missile attack on the regional center of Oskar, killing five people and injuring at least 31. By today, 23 people were still getting medical care in the hospital. This included eight people in severe condition, four of whom were in critical state, including a four-year-old girl, according to Oskar Governor Ola Kepra. 
In Donetsk, on blast, one person was killed and two others were injured in an attack on the village of Kaloriska in Poskets uh, district, Governor Vadim Fuskets has said. In Kurskan, all blast, 17 settlements, including the regional center of Kurskan, have been under attack over the past day. The Kurskan Old Blast Military Administration reported that one person was killed and another was injured. Due to recent strikes, Russian attacks also damaged uh, 10 houses, a critical infrastructure facility, administration building, a cultural institution, and a car. In Karlov Old Blast, Russian troops attacked 18 settlements, including Karlov, Ukraine's second largest city. Governor Olif had reported that Russia struck Karlov with KAB guided bombs, injuring a 42 year old man. He was hospitalized with a serious condition. The village of Koskas Lodsky in the northeastern part of Karlov Oblast was also struck with a KAB gu uh, guided bomb. A 67 year old man was wounded due to the strike. So that's all I've got on that story there. Um. This other story here. Estonia will not force out Ukrainian men with expired passports. What's the story about here? So the Estonian Interior Ministry has no plans to forcibly send a Ukrainian draft aged men out of Estonia territory. Anyal Vaskis, the Ministry Advisor on Citizenship and Migration Policy, had said uh, today in an interview with Estonia media outlet ERR. Ukraine has not publicly appealed any of its partners or forces to otherwise restrict its male citizens living abroad. However, Kiev recently suspended new applicants for consultor supports and banned sending documents and passports to Ukrainian men of draft age 18 to 60 who reside outside of Ukraine. With some exceptions, Ukrainian men aged 18 to 16 are prohibited from leaving Ukraine during the war while martial law is in effect. Vic said that Ukrainian refugees with expired passports will not be sent out of the country, but they will not be able to travel or apply for visa. These residents can still apply for temporary resident permits or prolong the valid ones even without a passport. The identity verification can be carried out with other documents the Ministry Advisor had added. By April the 26th, 6,500 Ukrainian men aged 18 to 16 had a residence permit under this temporary protection in Estonia. In total, 31,000, nearly 31,000 war refugees had temporary resident permits with protection status in the country by late April, the ERR said. In October 2023, the EU officially prolonged the Temporary Protection Directive for Ukrainian refugees until March 2025. The EU also expressed its willingness to extend the protection beyond this date. Polish Foreign Minister Ruskis Skarzegliv previously said that Poland would wait for Kiev to take the initiative on how to bring her approach bringing Ukrainian men back to Ukraine. Lithuanian President uh, Galas Noska and the Prime Minister Igor Solos were in favour of helping bring back draft aged men to Ukraine, but only after consultations with Ukraine and the EU. So as you guys know, obviously more men are required. I'm just going to refresh it here while one way. As you guys know, more men are required obviously on the front line and they obviously changed the conscription not too long ago, which we've also covered here on the channel to 23. But it's entirely possible that they may... Um, they may... Uh, they may um, push the initiative to get more Ukrainian men who are who are out in these countries to come back as well. So Ukraine holds third round of negotiations with the US on bilateral security arrangements as well. So a Ukrainian team led by the head of the presidential office, Andrei Lemek, had the third round of negotiations with the US. On a future bi bilateral security agreement Yes, on yesterday, the presidential office had said... So Ukraine is seeking to sign bilateral security agreements, as many of its allies as possible, as it fights Russia's full-scale invasion. Excuse me. The agreements are based on a pledge made by a group of seven, G7 last July, which aims to bolster Ukraine's ability to resist Russian aggression. So far, nine have signed with Latvia, Finland, the UK, Germany, France, Denmark, Canada, Italy and the Netherlands. President Vladimir Zelensky previously said that Ukraine is moving towards an important agreement with the US, adding that the agreement could happen after Congress passes the $61 billion aid bill for Ukraine, which happened last week. The recent approval by the United States of a £61 billion aid package for Ukraine has significantly accelerated the negotiation progress process, and I am convinced that our leaders will be able to sign a bilateral security agreement in the future, Yamik had said. The parties discussed the contents of the agreement in detail, the, progression, uh, the progress of the negotiations, and the further plans of coordinated action. Yamek expressed hope that the bilateral security agreement between Kiev and Washington would directly contribute to the defeat of Russia and create a solid foundation for long-term cooperation. Ukraine has also begun negotiations of a draft biannual security agreement with Portugal, another country that joined the G7, joint a declaration of support for Ukraine in 2023. Zelensky announced in April that Kiev expects to sign more bilateral security agreements soon with some Nordic and Baltic countries there. So... 
uh that's uh that's hopefully those security arrangements will get sorted soon i'm just gonna refresh it one more time just to check to see um just seeing what else there is here um so a russian proxy claims ukraine missile strike on occupied uh, crimea here apparently so a russian proxy claimed on uh, today that air defenses had intercepted ukrainian missiles over the occupied crimean city of Daskovy and semipol overnight the news was collaborated by crimean wind and asgard telegram channels which also added that the crimean bridge was temporarily closed as a result yeah one of the things that, that ukraine are consistently trying to target is that crimean bridge and i don't blame them for doing so Vladimir Rogov, and Russian installed proxy in Zavarika Oblast, said the Ukrainian forces had used ATA CMS missiles in the attack but claimed that air defences prevented the missiles from landing. The assertion could not be independently verified. Ukraine's military intelligence declined to comment following a request from the Kiev Independent and the Security Service of Ukraine, the SBU, said it could not provide any information at the time of this publication. In recent months, Ukraine has intensified its attack in occupied Crimea, targeting Russian military assets in and around the Black Sea. Ukraine destroyed several units of military equipment in an attack on Russians' military aircraft in Dolorysky. On April 17th, Ukraine's military intelligence had reported. Two days earlier, Ukrainian forces carried out a missile strike on command posts in Crimea, where top officers were deployed, a military intelligence source told the Kiev Independent. And we'll do one more here before we go to state media map. So Germany delivers Skynex air defense systems, Marta vehicles and ammunition to Ukraine. So more weapons and supplies coming from Germany to U aid Ukraine here. So Germany has handed over 10 Marta infantry fighting vehicles, a Skynex air, air defense system, not Skynet, uh, ammunition for Leopard 2 tanks, uh, IRIS uh, TSLM air defense missiles and other aids. In its latest aid delivery to Ukraine, the German government had reported latest trance uh, further included over 29,000 rounds of German anti-aircraft systems, 7,500 7, 155mm artillery shells, 18,000 rounds of 40mm ammunition, and an unspecified number of 120mm mortar ammunition as well. Berlin has also delivered a TRLM 4D radar system, six Oscus M1070 tank transporters, 3,000 RGW 90 portable grenade launchers and 100,000 first aid kits. Ukraine further received a Beaver Bridge laying tank, a and Dance Armored Engineering Vehicle, nine mine clearing systems, and APM's protection systems for helicopters, 60 outboard motors, 600 LED lamps, and almost 2,000 camouflage nets and around 2,000 ponchos. The German government website also confirmed that the delivery of the third Patriot air defense system is also in the works. Berlin announced on the 13th of April it plans to deliver another Patriot system to Ukraine as Kiev desperately needs air, air defenses to repel Russian attacks. Germany has become one of Ukraine's leading military donors, sending only to the US, according to the Kiev Institute of the World Economic economy germany has supplied ukraine with 10 billion euros around 10.7 billion uh, dollars in military assistance as of late february the number of notable the number is notably lower than in january due to the change in the institution's methodology of monitoring aid so they are obviously consider keep continuing that there and just seeing there doesn't seem to be anything else on the on the reports there on the side there but so lots of different uh source stuff stuff going on in terms of uh bilateral security agreements with the us and um, more uh, military and weapons and aid there coming from germany um the position of what ukraine men are going to be uh, potentially whether they're going to be coming back or not that's going to be a continuous topic of debate or whether those who are out there uh those who are in countries like the uk and other european nations that's going to be a topic for debate of whether or not that it's right that they should be they should should they be forced to come back to come back to ukraine to fight for its country i, I do think there needs to be a serious question that needs to be needs to be asked so just before we wrap things up guys we're going to have a look at the deep state map so the time of this recording is for the latest update is on the 29th of april at 23 18 here guys so let's have a quick look at what's been happening so last we looked we know that they pushed quite a bit oh uh i always try, always try to play trying to play about with this map here so uh if we push in here so you can see avika here now this is it seems here 
yeah, they really, really have pushed quite a bit here. Obviously, if we go back a couple of days, guys, you can see, I think it was quite a few days ago, actually, where they, they literally had no, like, you really got to go quite a few days back before they, uh, yeah, we're talking quite a few days ago now, since this is the 17th here, but if you just start pushing it forward, you can see they were continuously uh, pushing more forces through, and they took uh, the village of Oscar Ting there, and they continued to uh, push out there. And this is not good, obviously, when you're trying to hold these positions and they're gaining these surroundings, obviously. And uh, as time kept pushing on, they're pushing out more and more territory here. Yeah, they're really pushing. Like, again, it's you can argue these may be small gains, but it's still, it's still gains without a shadow of a doubt in the area in the area Donetsk is really um it's really difficult um not good at all really they're having trouble holding that position I know that other other positions on the front they're not really Ukraine are not really I've been able to hold to a certain extent um if, I, if you just pull back here you can see here like this is just a just pulling the days you can see there's not much push here see the main the main engagements are obviously in Donetsk here um, they're not really able, Ukraine to, um, Russia, sorry, are able to make much gains here anywhere else. They are obviously trying to make some uh, make some ground, but there's not really, nothing else is really moving. Um, I've not seen any other movement apart from Avika is where the main, main uh, movement hasn't been any other movement here. Let's just have a scroll back to see. Um, tiny tiny bit maybe but nothing too much outside of avika really there has not been much uh, movement there's been a little bit of movement um here just outside the donetsk there just below avika there's been a little bit of movement there but nothing too much has there been any movement uh down here there's obviously i'm not seeing yeah since it, remember the green is the green the green parts are what was territory that they recaptured in their counter offensive um last year for those who are wondering what the green means that was when ukraine had their counter offensive last year and took back a lot of territory um but at the moment guys yeah it's the main the main crux of what's happening is what's taking place within donetsk there and they they are slowly pushing gaining ground there russia and obviously they are getting more weapons aid and supplies right now from from america since that big coming but they need to obviously try and stop it. They need to find they need to find a ground where they can kind of just hold a position and be able to hold that position uh, vehemently because ever since they lost the city of Avika, they have been losing ground in Donetsk. Apart from Donetsk, everywhere else is kind of pretty stable. Um, it's pretty stable to say the least, guys. So that is that is one of the good things so far in in terms of the conflict, anyway. Um, um, but obviously any lives lost is obviously a terrible tragedy to say the least guys so um, we do hope that they are able to slow down slow it down yes again it's small small gains that Russia are gained but it's still gains nonetheless for them so the the war is going in the right direction for them but it's just quite slowly but obviously that we know that Russia are throwing thousands and thousands of lives are, throwing, are being lost throwing so many bullets and ammunition they're throwing at this as well but um we can't let Ukraine uh, fall. Um, you know, I, I have, you know, since the the aid package that came in from from the US has given me renewed hope. Uh, perhaps that um, I, I do think a part of it feels like it's also a time, it's bought time as well. Um, but obviously, let's uh, hopefully they can keep keep things where they are. And, and hopefully not lose too much ground and find a firm line where they can stop stop the, the advancement of Russia in, in Donetsk at least. Um, because if they continue to push at some point, other other lines are going to start faltering. So sooner they get uh, the weapons and ammunition and, and more bodies they can into that front into the front lines, the better. In, especially in Donetsk, because it really is quite a battle there at the moment for for Ukraine. Yeah. I know, Ollie. I know, um, but Ollie, Ollie is optimistic about about it. I'm 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 a bit torn still about what's going to happen, but we'll have to wait and see. But uh, yeah, the orb is uh, there in all its glory. The lava. Land.
Ah, oh, there we go. I have no idea why the mic cut out there. It's literally turned itself completely off. Barely touched the wire. I'm always having this problem with the wire. Oh. Right. Let me just finish this properly. So, guys, I want to say a massive thank you to everyone who's come along. Thank you for uh, watching. If you watched all the way through, I want to say a massive thank you on behalf of myself, on behalf of Ollie, Cash Dummy, and uh, Pingu here. Guys, what did you make of some of the stories that we covered today? We covered a variety of different stories, stories in um, quite a bit in America, conflict in Sudan, Bangladesh's heat waves, um, uh, Australia, and, of course, the conflict excuse me, in Ukraine. What do you guys make of all these stories and more? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below or what you guys think of all of these. But just before you go, if you can, if you can do one more thing for me before you guys go, if you haven't already, please hit the like button. We greatly appreciate it. Share across social media so others are notified of this video and subscribe because it really does help support the channel. And if you want to go one step further and financially support me and the work that I do here, you can do so by becoming a YouTube member for as little as 99p or join me on Rumble or Patreon for exclusive content there as well. So thank you all so much for watching. I hope to catch you all very, very soon.